very much for the uh, invitation, Andrea Cecil and uh, Sebastian. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to share my work in progress with you. Um, and uh, just for a disclaimer, mainly for the tape, uh, the brief I got was work in progress. This is very much work in progress. Um, I uh, hope that these arguments are all going to work out eventually, but I'm probably going to say some things that are not going to end up in the final version of the paper. Um, so that's just a bit of a warning. Um, okay, so I'm interested in whether or not we can have proportional punishment in the context of structural injustice. Um, and I want to argue that yes, proportional punishment is possible in the context of structural injustice. Um, however, uh, we need to realize, uh, we need to think more carefully about what we are considering to be similar to what. Right. So uh, for similar cases, we need to consider the differences between individuals who are being punished um, in addition to um, considering similarities and differences between um, offences as unique cases. So I want to start off by talking about uh, proportionality and what we take that to be. So uh, proportionality gives us these two uh, related intuitions about punishment. So on the one hand, we've got that more serious cases should be punished more seriously. This is an idea of vertical proportionality so that we can have an ordinal ranking. Um, and the idea that uh, similar cases should be punished similarly. This is a kind of a horizontal idea of equality between different offenders at different times who have nevertheless committed similar sorts of offences. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember where I read this uh, vertical horizontal distinction. It's not my distinction, it's someone else's. If anyone can remember, that would be awesome. Please let me know. Um, but I find these are, are, are helpful for pulling apart what's going on here. So these intuitions are useful for uh, thinking through what is an appropriate response to a wrong. And the first intu intuition is beset with well-known problems about measurement, about where do we anchor the scale, about how are these... Uh, things interchangeable. But nevertheless, Andrew Ashworth wants to argue that we can make some progress, right? So uh, if we think about um, offences, generally we think offences against the person that are deliberate and premeditated are worse than uh, offences against property that are um, not premeditated. Um, and if we think about punishments, generally we want to say that fines are kind of the least serious thing and then maybe being obliged to do community service is worse and then being sent to prison is actually quite bad and that we kind of get these sort of ordinal rankings. Nobody thinks drawing up these ordinal rankings is easy, nobody thinks tracking across from one list to the other is easy either. So um, Nigel Walker likens these two sort of ranked lists to two wobbly ladders, right, um, that have unevenly spaced rungs. So even if we figure out how to measure putting these two lists next to each other, trying to track across from one rung on one ladder might just put you in the space between two rungs on another ladder. It doesn't necessarily give you um, an immediate answer. Um, so Von Hirsch suggests that um, meeting proportionality requirements is a matter of degree. It's something we can never completely succeed at. And I think that's a really a helpful thing to be thinking about. It's more of an art than a science. It's an intuition that's helping us in these judgments. So I think the second intuition is more interesting. Um, Lacey and Picard note that proportionality can be a bit chimeric. Um, it shifts about depending on exactly what our criteria for similarity are. Um, I think this is crucial to, to understanding what's going on. This is, gives us the flexibility in, in what we're looking at, um, along with the, the wobbliness of Walker's ladders is why I think that um, proportionality has the flexibility in it to deal with individual personal and social circumstances of people who are being punished. Um, circumstances which can and do interact with the sentence ordered by the court, sometimes with disastrous consequences. Um, so this is why I think proportionality needs to be engaging with personal and social circumstances. So how is this proportionality thing justified? So most often we take ourselves to be providing um, proportionate penal disadvantage that reflects some function of the culpability of the person who's committed the crime, um, along with the amount of harm that they caused or that they aimed to be caused um, when they were committing the crime. Uh, but if we are claiming that we're providing fair proportionate punishment, then we need to think about how the effects, this is going to affect those individuals who are being punished. Um, expected effects are how we think about um, what proportionality is in the, in the first place. So we do this for kind of generalised, abstracted offenders when we are making up our lists in the first place or drawing up walkers wobbly ladders. Um, 
but it's not people in the abstract who are actually punished, it's particular people who are punished. So sometimes a punishment can have a much greater effect on an individual than is intended by the court, and I'll come back to that later, but here's why this matters for proportionality. So if we ignore the experiences of the person being punished, then we might end up losing this horizontal proportionality between different offenders. Um, so you could get two people given identical sentences for identical offences um, that nevertheless have wildly different outcomes in terms of how much disvalue that person gets. Um, and if we uh, distort this kind of horizontal proportionality, then we also might end up upsetting vertical proportionality as well. So um, a person who is uh, committing a much less serious offence may, through this accident of their circumstances, find that their punishment is much more onerous than a person who is apparently uh, being given a much more serious punishment for a much more serious offence. Um, so we could mean we could be targeting several things when we're trying to use proportionality, but if we're explaining proportionality as expressing solidarity with the victim of the crime, then we need a little bit more explanation about why we should care about the experiences of the person punished. So what we're targeting here is something that's proportional to having the right kind of um, sympathy for, empathy for, um, reflecting that uh, the victim of the crime was wronged, should not have been wronged, was treated in the way they should not have been, um, and trying to reinstate them in some way. Um, then why should we care about the effects on the offender? So um, firstly, I want to say that absolutely the state owes things to victims and probably the community does too. Um, and one of the things the state owes to victims of crime is that perpetrators are pursued and prosecuted and punished wherever this is possible. Um, but whatever else it is that we owe to the victims of crime, it's probably not best provided through criminal punishment. So what happens when we are punishing someone is the state is addressing the person who has committed the crime. Um, and if we are communicating anything more broadly, it is done through the, the actions of the state on that person. Um, and so I think it's important to treat the, the offender as being the, the primary audience, the person who's committed the crime. Um, Further, we, we want to have punishments that are um, also in victims' interests. And if we are facilitating desistance, then that's probably in the victim's interest too. So one way we might do that is by showing that we have these fair punishments um, that are providing the, the right amount of penal disadvantage that we think people should have, um, and that are maybe also helping people to move away from offending. So um, I'll come back to this later, but there is some uh, suggestion in social research that um, if you take someone who's given a very short prison sentence or someone who's given um, a community punishment, actually those are about the same, um, but the community punishment tends to have a better outcome in terms of reducing recidivism. Okay, so taking proportionality seriously, let's have a, a think about this example of structural injustice. Um, no, to be clear, I, I don't think there's anything particularly special about structural injustice. I just think it's a really clear example of an injustice that we can look at. Um, I think we're going to need to uh, think about um, these kinds of problems in all instances of trying to punish proportionally. So Young's classic example of structural injustice is uh, the case of Sandy, who is a single parent in low paid city centre employment. She lives near to her work and her landlord decides to sell up for redevelopment. So the landlord does no wrong, he provides the legally required notice. Sandy searches for new accommodation for her family, but she finds that she can't afford any of the other city centre rents, nor can she afford rents that are near to bus routes. So she resolves to buy a car with her savings and manages to find some minimally satisfactory accommodation that she can commute by car to her, her job from. However, while she can expect to meet her outgoing monthly bills, um, with, uh, with her wages, she can't pay the rent in advance that the new landlord asks for as a standard market practice um, because she's already spent her savings on a car. Um, so consequently, through nobody's wrongdoing, and this is important for young, nobody does anything wrong, um, Sandy and her children wind up homeless. Um, so no one does anything wrong. Nevertheless, we have this outcome that seems to be unjust. So recently, structural injustice has been broadened to include um, other cases of um, uh, injustices which are structural in origins, they are come from these kind of uh, ways in which society is set up, but they're not necessarily as blameless, um, because it's becoming less convincing to argue that we're not aware of injustices or we, we don't understand our part in the socioeconomic structures that create these injustices. Um, and an important thing to note about Jung's work is that she's 
primarily interested in thinking about, well, how can we motivate people to act on duties they have to work together to address injustices? She's not interested in apportioning blame um, because that's not generally a helpful way to motivate people towards making changes. So she's interested in what can we do to, to change things? And I think um, that criminal justice, um, criminal punishment can also be used to address structural injustices. So I don't think there's anything special about structural justice, but it is a good example of injustice, right? So if you think about Tommy Shelby's example of poor urban communities in the, of colour in the US. So members of these communities are suffering intersecting effects of the legacies of enslavement, of overt state-approved second-class status, um, best um, unconscious bias of all individuals uh, who have been socialised in these conditions. Um, and the explicit racial prejudice of some people. Um, and they're also suffering the effects of poverty and concentrated disadvantage over time. So families of colour have not been able to accrue wealth and um, material wealth in the same way that white families haven't inherited in the same way. Um, and as a result of these structural injustices, uh, Shelby argues that members of poor urban communities of colour don't receive their fair share of benefits in terms of uh, access to material goods and opportunities in the same way as everybody else sufficient for equal citizenship. So that undermines for Shelby um, the state's standing to, to call members of these communities to account for criminal wrongs. So I just think that's that's a pretty clear example of something that's unjust and something that's going to be a context that person might exist in that's going to affect how their punishment works for them. Um, so a clear example of um, how proportionate punishments might be experienced differently um, when the, someone's personal and social circumstances are interacting with how they are being punished. So I think this explains why we need to take collateral consequences seriously. Um, so just to be clear about what I am talking about and what I'm not talking about, um, Bentham gives us an argument that um, if you give two people the same punishment, um, then uh, they're going to experience it differently. And that's, that's just uh, how people are. And um, Adam Kolber has a, a nice paper on sensitive and insensitive prisoners. So if you imagine two people serving the same sentence, maybe they're cellmates, one of them is terribly sensitive and finds the prison sentence almost unbearable, and the other one just isn't, and kind of really isn't that bothered. Um, they're, they're just, you know, well, it's a bit annoying, but um, I don't mind too much. Um, and these, these are differences which are kind of internal to the person's individual psychological makeup. Um, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in external circumstances of the individual, um, which we can access, which we can see, and we can take into consideration um, if we actually pay attention to them. Um, I think one clear example of this is structural injustice. So let's have a look at an example of how things can go wrong for an individual. Um, the example I'm going to give you here is drawn from another paper, which is currently under review. But there's a similar one in the paper which you guys have seen, um, which is drawn from uh, my work uh, uh, in helping uh, people who have been uh, convicted to find resettlement solutions. Um, so Christine and Christina both work as store clerks at a big name drugstore. Right? They each have a history of anxiety and two small children. But other than that, their circumstances are quite different. So Christine lives in the suburbs with a supportive, high earning spouse. Um, who pays all the bills and her earnings are just paying for her hobbies. Right? She, while she's at work, she's got four grandparents who are caring for her child, for her children. Um, Christina, meanwhile, is a single parent and she lives in city centre social housing and her earnings, which are supplemented by benefits, are covering bills and essentials. Christina's mother is able to provide some childcare, but paid for childcare is also necessary for Christina. Um, then one day, Christine and Christina decide to take equal shares in stealing designer um, skincare products from their employer, and they each receive six month prison sentences. So Christine's family are able to step up their childcare while she's in prison, and they notice that the prison sentence aggravates her pre-existing anxiety. So on release from prison, her family support her emotionally, and they help her financially to start a small business selling her handicrafts. Christina's children are taken into state care because her mother can't provide full-time childcare for them. Christina loses her eligibility for housing benefit because of the length of time she's away from home. That's got nothing to do with the fact that she's been convicted of an offence. Um, I can explain that in more detail if you have questions. But uh, Christina loses her uh, benefit eligibility and because of that, she can't otherwise pay rent. So she's evicted um, by her landlord. On release, Christina is homeless 
estranged from her children and is struggling with her mental health. All right. So we can see here how two people have done exactly the same crime, they've got exactly the same punishment, but they have these wildly different outcomes. Um, no court intends for people to have their mental health significantly impaired as a result of their punishment, or intends for people to be made homeless. I don't think they could intend for that, even if they wanted to, because th that would be significantly breaching people's basic rights. Um, so sometimes having very, very basic information about the personal and social circumstances of the person to be punished could help sentences to avoid these serious additional harms by making a small adjustment to the sentence. So had the sentencer known that uh, Christina was uh, a claimant for housing benefits, maybe the sentence could have been adjusted slightly. Now, I think adjusting the sentences is going to be possible because of the flexibility we see in proportionality. So as Ashworth says, you can make some progress towards trying to have these ordinal ranked lists, but uh, we can also recognize that while we think that generally offenses against people that are deliberate are worse than offenses against property, sometimes it can be the other way around. So my accidentally burning down your home is probably worse than my deliberately wrapping you across the knuckles. Um, even though one of them is a, a deliberate um, thing against a person and the other one is uh, accidental and against property. Um, and likewise, there is some degree of flexibility in um, how we look at how serious sentences are. So we already think there's some degree of uh, overlap between a short prison sentence and a long community sentence. And maybe if you had a really big fine, that might be worse than a, a small community punishment. Um, so uh, Lipka makes an interesting argument about supermax prison conditions. So uh, this is solitary confinement in the US, which is designed to be uh, particularly severe and austere and much, much worse than kind of regular prison conditions. Um, and Lipka argues, well, if you're going to change the severity of the prison conditions, then logically you have to reduce the length of the sentence if you're going to keep it proportionate. So again, there seems to be this little bit of wiggle room in how we sentence and what we sentence people to, um, to uh, that might allow us to make some kind of change here. And again, um, as I've said, social researchers have suggested there is some interchangeability between um, community punishments that are quite long and short prison sentences, uh, with the exception that community punishments tend to have a, a better outcome at reducing recidivism than short prison sentences. Um, so I don't think adjusting the sentence is going to frustrate proportionality. I don't think Christine can complain if Christina's sentence is altered slightly, perhaps is suspended, perhaps she's given a community um, punishment rather than a prison sentence. Um, perhaps there is a practice uh, like a weekend detention, periodic detention, which is used in uh, some countries like the Netherlands, for instance. Um, so I don't think uh, adjusting the sentence is frustrating proportionality. Um, I think it's actually taking it seriously. We're taking seriously the similarities and differences between the individuals who are being punished, as well as the similarities and differences between the offences, uh, which I think in practice we do much better at taking account of how offences are unique um, than we do um, the people who've committed them. So with that in mind, let's have a think about how proportionality is practiced. So despite um, recent changes in the sentencing guidelines in England and Wales, uh, we do better at valuing information that helps us to understand the offence than we do about the person to be punished. Um, so we tend to prioritise aggravating factors over mitigation. Um, so these are listed first in the sentencing guidelines in the same step. The lists of them are non-exhaustive, um, although the list of aggravating factors is much longer than the list of uh, mitigating factors. Um, until recently, uh, statutory mitigation only included sort of early guilty pleas and assisting the prosecution. Um, now it also includes um, the individual's mental well-being, uh, following some changes at the end of 2020. Um, but the guidelines now include in mitigation the kinds of information that I'm suggesting should be front and centre of penal decision making. Um, in order to try and avoid these really problematic collateral consequences. So if someone is the sole care of a dependent relatives or if they have um, medical conditions that require immediate intensive treatment or if they have a mental disorder. Um, but again, we're, we're still seeing that there's a longer list of aggravating factors and we put that first in the same step of the sentencing guidelines. And um, at the same time, this is, this is thinking through very much how is this information helping us to understand how serious the offence was, 
rather than thinking about how is this punishment going to be experienced by the person who's actually going to be punished for it. Um, likewise, this kind of information is already valued and treated as important and included in pre-sentence reports, um, but these do tend to focus on risk assessments uh, rather than providing uh, personal and social circumstance information. Um, and sentences can, of course, choose to proceed without a report or to ignore a report if it does exist. Um, and I think this information is really important if we're going to be able to adjust sentences to fit both the crime, but also the, the individual. Um, so I talk about five objections in the paper, but due to time, I'm only going to talk about the two that I think are most important here. Happy to talk about the others and the questions. Um, so we might wonder, does this risk under punishment? Right. So in the paper, I raised the example of Lavinia Woodward. Um, so this was a case of um, a woman who was uh, convicted of assaulting her boyfriend with a bread knife whilst drunk. Um, but she was also um, a wealthy, white, um, privileged uh, woman who was also a medical student at the University of Oxford. Uh, elsewhere, I've discussed the, the Brock Turner case, but I'll focus on Woodward here. So the, the problem here is not that um, Woodward is receiving unduly lenient punishment because of her privilege. It's that her privilege allows her to get her circumstances taken seriously. So she's able to privately afford uh, to be represented by a QC, who persuades the judge that uh, the sentencing should be deferred. Um, now, this is an option which is open all of the time, um, but um, it's not often used because of the pressures on court time and space and the expense that causes. Um, and when the, the case is uh, deferred for sentence, the sentencing is deferred, uh, this means that they're able to request a pre-sentence report and three medical reports, um, which is uh, much more than would happen in a, a usual case. Um, um, Woodward is also able to use this time to seek, again, privately funded um, treatment for addiction issues um, and so when she comes back to court for sentencing, the sentencer is able to take into account the pre-sentence report, the medical reports, and also to give her further credit for having pursued um, this uh, addiction treatment herself. Um, so what I want to say is it's not the problem that this information is considered, it's that it's not routinely considered in the same way for people who don't have this kind of privilege. That's the problem. Um, so I, I don't think we do risk under sentencing and um, if we do, I think it's only to the extent that we should probably prefer that um, guilty people are not convicted uh, rather than innocent people are convicted. Um, but I, I think that that's not too much of a problem. Something I think is a big problem is the threat to offenders' privacy. So um, I think we should worry that this might undermine the privacy of the individual who's being punished. Right. So um, we can make some way towards minimising this risk, but risks can only ever be managed rather than eliminated. So there can be policies about how data is gathered and stored and shared and used. Um, and these policies can come with teeth, with oversight, with means of appeal, with incentives for compliance. Um, we already see in sentencing guidelines expectations that um, sentences are going to explain their reasoning. So we can expect that these are going to be these decisions can be explained. Um, and I think that the information that sentences are going to need in order to tailor sentences enough just to avoid these uh, serious types of collateral consequences which threaten people's basic rights or kind of threaten to undermine their well-being um, is, is only very basic. It doesn't have to be detailed information. So are you a benefit claimant? Uh, which type of benefits are you claiming? Do you have a pre-existing mental health diagnosis? Is it one of this type or one of that type? These are not detailed personal questions about your financial history or your medical records. Um, so I think that slight degree of um, only requiring this kind of intermediate level uh, information might be helpful. But I think finally, we can always leave it open to uh, the person who's being sentenced to decline to provide this information. All that would mean is that they would be sentenced as people are now. Um, it's not going to be any better than things are currently, but um, it might protect them if they're worried about it. Um, but I think in principle, it matters that individuals are given a chance to be heard to explain their circumstances and the worries they might have about how a particular type of sentence might produce unintended, sometimes disastrous consequences for them um, that the, the court wouldn't intend in any case. All right. So is this the, the best way to address structural injustice? Absolutely not. No. Uh, criminal sentencing probably isn't the, the best place to uh, provide welfare support of any kind. 
Um, is this the only thing the state should do to address structural injustice? No, um, plenty of other things should be happening. But when we are presented with this uh, situation where we have to sentence someone, um, should we ignore it? No, I don't think we can ignore structural injustice then either. So as Young suggests, we need to work together using whatever small powers we have to challenge structural injustice wherever we find it, whenever we can. Um, and that's why I think it's especially important in cases of structural injustice to try to get proportionality right by including this information about the individual. Thanks a lot. That was tremendously clear uh, and, and helpful on an already <laughs> clear and helpful paper. Um, we're going to take just um, three minutes break so we can join again at half past uh, for everyone to take a rest and also for everyone to uh, write your question in the chat as you already um, started to do uh, so that we can then start the Q&A right away. See you in three minutes. <laughs>